So what, what do you make of, uh, I mean, the AP News headline, U.S. kills Iran's most powerful general in Baghdad airstrike. This guy's name is General Qasem Soleimani. Uh, what, what, what's the significance of this, if any? Well, oh, there'll be significance, though I think it might be a little too early to tell at this point. Um, Any time that there's an assassination of a high-ranking political or military official of a foreign country, that's usually pretty big news, uh, and it's usually not undertaken lightly, but there's also usually ramifications involved. Um, As you point out, this is not an everyday event. What exactly the particular ramifications of this will be, there's been sort of a tit-for-tat going on between the U.S. and Iran uh, for the past month or so. And whether or not this will result in continued escalations, I think, remains to be seen. Of course, the Ayatollah suggested that there would be serious ramifications. But what exactly, what form those will take, I couldn't possibly speculate. News articles are saying uh, World War III is imminent. Of course, there'll be some continued military uh Dialogue, and I don't mean dialogue in terms of talking, I mean dialogue in terms of probably shooting. But what exactly form that will take, I couldn't possibly speculate. Of course, we're recording this on January 3rd, so the uh, the, the death of uh, General Suleimani occurred last night. And, uh, well, time will tell for sure. I mean, it makes, certainly makes for an exciting beginning to 2020. <laughs> Absolutely. Usually such things do not result in the situation calming down. So 2020 could get very exciting between the U.S. and Iran. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of What's the Res? We're here to host the ongoing conversation about the current resolutions in the world of high school debate. My name is Josh Herring. I'm a humanities instructor and debate coach at Thales Academy in Rollsville, North Carolina. My guest today is uh, now Dr. Nathan Orlando. Uh, Nathan came on the show months ago. Uh, He helped us out with a summer analysis episode, getting ready for people competing at NSDA Nationals in 2019 for Lincoln Douglas. Nathan, am I right in remembering that we were talking about um, whether or not when it's justified to participate in violent revolution last time you came on the show? I think that yes. was it. Excellent. Uh, now, uh, Nathan, I didn't write this out. Could you remind us where you are currently a professor at? And uh, also give us, uh, at least give us the title of your now defended dissertation. So I am a professor at... St. Vincent, I'm a postdoctoral fellow, I should say, at St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And my dissertation was called Raymond Aron and His Dialogues in an Age of Ideologies. That is a delightfully comprehensible dissertation topic <laughs> or dissertation title. <laughs> my advisor was adamant that I not have a colon involved. Ah. And so therefore, it's right to the point. Excellent. I, you know, I, I, you, you know, I'm a big fan of the liberal arts, and uh, I, I, I got myself in trouble this past summer. I had dinner with a, a friend. I discovered, of course, of the dinner that lo and behold, her name's Erin Foles. That she actually has a PhD in mathematics, and oh. I then asserted that my liberal arts background would enable me to understand the topic of her dissertation. That was a false statement. I I learned very quickly that just because I have read a lot of books and enjoy talking to people about books, that does not mean that I am capable of understanding a high-level theoretical mathematical concept, much less the sentence about that concept. So I I appreciate the comprehensibility of your dissertation. (laughs) I aim to please. Well, today, of course, we are uh, here to discuss the January-February Lincoln-Douglas resolution that reads, Resolved, states ought to eliminate their nuclear arsenals. Students nationwide uh, have been getting ready to uh, compete on this resolution. That uh, I suspect there are a bunch of tournaments that will be debating this tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, And they'll be going throughout the months of January and February. So... Nathan, hit us with your first observations about this resolution. What what leaps out at you in the claim states ought to eliminate their nuclear arsenals? Two things jump out at me with this resolution. Ought and there. 
first going to the easier one there. The agent of action is the states acting upon themselves. It is not some international agency going around and taking everybody's nuclear weapons and throwing them in the garbage pile, the international nuclear garbage pile. But states are acting upon themselves, which, of course, brings about all sorts of problems with solvency, as we're going to get into later, I'm sure. The other thing that jumps out at me is ought to. Now, this may have changed since I did debate, but at least when I did uh, when I did debate, that was indicative of a value proposition or what was called a value proposition. Because ought functions as an auxiliary verb. It's not a verb itself. It is sort of a bracketing, if you will. Same way that should is. That states should eliminate their nuclear arsenals. All things being equal, centris paribus, all things being equal, this would be a good idea. There's some sort of obligation that goes along with this. But it's not necessarily going to happen. It's not necessarily suggesting the action follow the assessment of whether that obligation is valid. In other words, it's a debate about whether or not this is a good idea at a theoretical level rather than a practical level. Those are my initial observations. I think that's an interesting observation because when LD is done under any kind of traditional framework, it does function – that ought does indicate a value proposition, and that's critical for good debate. Of course, a lot of LD debaters are now going in a much more progressive direction, and they would like to ignore the value proposition component of LD as much as possible. So I think this is going to be that's going to set this debate up in two very different directions. Either this is a theoretical debate, in which case AF does have an enormous amount of ground, or this is basically a one-man policy kind of round. In which case, I don't know what ground AF has if this ha- if this is a policy debate, because I think solvency kills AF's position entirely. There is no way to do this effectively. On in terms of actual real politique, that's just not going to work. So I think anyone who gets the affirmative on this round, you need to fight tooth and nail to hold on to that theoretical ground that ought gives you access to. Otherwise, you've already you've lost the round as soon as Neg says, but it's not feasible. And from the other direction, if the AF wants to take it in a practical direction, a policy direction, the Neg needs to nail them. Because now you are fiating multiple agents of action. Uh, eight states at the current count have at least admitted to having nuclear weapons. There are, of course, more. But you're now taking action for multiple states, which is impossible. So that could be a fun theoretical debate. Uh, and I enjoy nothing more than a good theory debate. But if you actually want to get down to the substance of the issue, make sure that you lay out the proposition as it is. Theory debates are they, – they can be fun, though I it, – it, for my money at least, does, when I'm judging, I like to see people who are agreed on the nature of debate they're having. When you have one person who is having a theory debate and the other person is having a substance debate, it's – they just talk past each other and it's, it, it's, it's irritating. But when both agree, you know what? We have to get the theory ground settled first. Then we'll get the substance. That can be really fun. Oh, absolutely. And there's nothing more frustrating than as a judge watching two debaters talk past each other so that at the end of the day, they've had two different debates and it's entirely left in the judge's lap to flip a coin. I know that I, I want to give a double loss, but Tab hates double loss. So, you know, anyway, let's get on to a, a, a first substantive question then. Uh, Nathan, help us with some background. Which states have nuclear arsenals? And which of those, I know you mentioned eight a moment ago with the implication that there are probably more than the officially recognized eight. And of those that have nuclear arsenals, are there states that you would say these are a particular concern for launching nuclear weapons? So the states that officially have nuclear weapons, but they're very open about it, are the United States, the, uh, the, well, the former Soviet Union, now Russia, uh, the United Kingdom, France, the People's Republic of China, India, Pakistan, and North Korea. Those are the official 
nuclear powers. Now, there have been nuclear powers in the past who have given up their nuclear weapons. These include South Africa, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. The last three because they were part of the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, that'll be an interesting story for later. Now, other unofficial, the, the, the rest, the states that don't have nuclear weapons, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, include Israel, of course, and Iran. Now, there's also certain rumors Taiwan had nuclear material, so on and so forth. And, of course, there are certain states that are very close to having nuclear weapons. States like Japan, in a matter of a month or so, Japan could have a nuclear weapon. All the materials are sort of laid out on the table. So it's not officially a nuclear power, but could become one very quickly. To your second question, states that are particu of particular concern. North Korea, of course, that's the hot topic of conversation was in 2019, I'm sure will be once again in 2020. Um, of course, we started the episode talking about Iran. That could be of particular concern. They don't have nuclear capabilities just yet that we know of, but that was, of course, the substance of the uh, treaty with Iran under the Obama administration. Of concern as well is the India and Pakistan situation especially with the escalation in political tensions in August of 2019 over the Kashmir region. These are particular problem points. Of course, Israel with the uncertainty in the Middle East as well. These are particular problematic situations, and we can get into the details of any of those in particular that you'd like. Well, let, let's focus on two for the moment. Um, tell, me, tell me a bit more about North Korea, because – how how much do we know about North Korea? How much are we suspecting? Uh, uh, how how real is the how how real is the threat of North Korea nuclear missiles from your perspective? I'm sorry. Uh, one more addendum to the previous question. There are also a few states that host nuclear weapons uh, that I forgot to list: Belgium, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, and Turkey are not nuclear powers, but they have nuclear weapons in their territory under the NATO arms agreement. So these, it is difficult for those countries to launch nuclear weapons because the United States has the official code, but they're unofficially nuclear powers. So, so those, um, wait, wait, back that up. That's, I have never heard of this before. This is really interesting. So that means those are American nukes that are hosted by allied countries. Mm -hmm. For all intents and purposes, it's what's called a double key system. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But think of it that as both countries, both the United States and the host country, need to be able to push the button at the same time. If either of them pushes it without the other, no go, which is not that big of a deal for the United States. The United States has other nuclear weapons that it doesn't need uh, cooperation for. But... This is in response to the outcome of World War II, where certain states, as part of the peace agreement with Germany, was Germany, you can never have nuclear weapons because you remember that thing you did a couple of years ago? We don't like that, and we'd rather not give you nuclear weapons. So they play host, um, which is good strategically for the United States, that we sort of spread our missiles out, and it gives them a degree of security, and this was a particularly important during the Cold War having nuclear weapons on European soil. Yes. Wow. Okay. Which that's really helpful because I know uh, when Ethan was researching this, he found there are several websites that only talk about, I think the number he came up with was nine, but there were these eight or nine officially recognized, but there's a lot less internet traffic about, in terms of like free Googleable articles that were about listing all of those others, and we didn't come up with the host states. That's really interesting. Okay, let's go to North Korea. Talk, talk, tell us more about North Korea. I mean, is, is this just a hoax? Is this Kim Jong-un kind of playing a joke? Is, is this real? Is this a real threat of nuclear missiles in North Korea? So first of all, let's not go to North Korea. That's usually <laughs> a bad plan. And usually you don't leave. So let's not go there, but I'd be more than happy to talk about it. Let's talk it's about North Korea then. It's certainly not a hoax. Uh, Kim Jong-un and his father before him, we conducted a number of nuclear tests, particularly underground. You can go Google up images of underground uh, North Korean nuclear tests. One of the ways that we're able to 
tell when nuclear explosions happen is not only satellite reconnaissance, but also uh, seismographs. And nuclear weapons create many earthquakes, essentially. And so you can see based on this, even if we didn't have the testimony of people who had been there, you can see based on the movement of geography that they're exploding uh, nuclear weapons underground. So they have nuclear weapons. That's It's not the same as the Iran situation, where Iran is still working to develop nuclear weapons. North Korea already has them. That's done. What they don't have is the other important part of a nuclear weapon, which is the delivery mechanism. And that's why one of the hot-button issues of 2019 was North Korean missile tests. They regularly, leading up to uh, Kim Jong-un's talks with Trump, would go fire off missiles, trying to see how far they could get a missile to fly. And so they were sending them over Japan and out into the uh, South China Sea in an effort to develop in what's essentially an ICBM, an intercontinental uh, ballistic missile, with the goal of being able to reach anywhere on the planet, including the United States. Now, they're able to get them in deep into the Pacific right now. And there's talk that you know it won't be very long before they're able to hit at least the west coast of America. But that's sort of the situation. So this is not hype. It just is. And that's the importance of President Trump's talks with North Korea at the moment in order to try to rein in North Korea's nuclear program before the their missile technology is perfected. Interesting. So for the affirmative position then, that would have to include states like North Korea and Iran. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, now, uh, one other thing to help me with Israel and Israel's nuclear missile count or nuclear capacity count. Do, do they have hundreds, thousands, tens? How, how many nuclear missiles do you, do, does Israel actually have? And what, what sources of information do we have about that? Now, the key term there is actually have. Because officially, North uh, Israel has zero nuclear weapons. They are a non-nuclear power. Again, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. They've not acknowledged the existence of nuclear weapons, and they will be unlikely to do so, and they keep this as a closely guarded secret. Now, do they have nuclear weapons? You started off the show by calling me an expert, which I still don't know how uh, on board with that I am, but as an ex so-called expert, scare quote mar quotation marks included, yeah, they probably have nuclear weapons. They have a very good science program. They have the missile technology. Yeah, they're probably they they probably have them. In terms of numbers, I don't know. I couldn't begin to speculate. I'm sure there are a number of articles out there speculating. You could probably Google this up and you get a number of experts weighing in and probably none of them would agree with each other. They have the capacity. They probably have the capacity. Now, remind me of the second part of your question. Oh. Um, I don't remember the second part of my question. So let's go on to a new question then. Okay. So if we assume that Israel does have nukes and Iran is actively pursuing nuclear technology, particularly offensive nuclear technology, not just electric plants and so on, um, what actually – now, I would assume, based on a lot of the things that uh, the Ayatollahs have said over the years and the supreme leaders of Iran have said over the years, that if Iran does get a nuclear missile, that one of the first things it will do is launch that and hit um, – ter or not Tehran, hit uh, – and, and launch and hit Jerusalem. Uh, is, is that – or Tel Aviv was the other city I was trying to think of. Tel Aviv or Jerusalem is going to go up in flames. Would you agree with that assessment, or, or is that unlikely to happen for some reason? You always have to approach the Ayatollah statements with a certain reservation. And this has been true of political rhetoric since the days of Thucydides. You have to be mindful of the audience and your your own audience in this podcast as debaters, as practitioners of rhetoric, should be mindful of this as well. You speak to the people 
well, for lack of a better term, you speak to the people that you're speaking to and not necessarily to everybody. So right after the uh, Iran Treaty with uh, President Obama and the Ayatollah, for example, the Iranian political establishment was out the next day chanting death to America. Now, that seems sort of an odd juxtaposition when you have when you've just signed this treaty. But his audience was the masses. The audience was the base that the Ayatollah wanted to reassure that, no, 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 we're still the same country. We still have the same priorities. We did not just sell out with this treaty, in other words. He's very good at playing to the base. And this is all we hear about in the West is when he plays to the base. That said, sometimes it's best to take people seriously with what they say. Is it just playing to the base, or is this actually a serious policy move? In order to understand that, you have to understand a lot more about the Iranian regime, which I claim to be, titles aside, uh, I claim to be no expert in Iranian politics. But you can look at the practicalities of the situation. The minute that Iran launches nuclear weapons, Iran becomes target number one. For Israel, for the United States, uh, the UK, and everybody else. One of the reasons why nuclear deterrence works, at least it did during the Cold War, is because nobody wanted to be the first one to launch. Once you launch, your cards are on the table. In the case of Israel, assuming that it does have nuclear weapons, if they see nuclear weapons flying towards Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, there is nothing to lose. They launch everything at Iran. And considering the capacity that they don't have, scare quotes, it would probably be pretty devastating. Now, whether or not this fits with the images of uh, the apocalypse that the Ayatollah conjures were okay with all being martyrs for the cause, bringing about the end times in order to liberate the world from uh, Israel or however his speech goes, maybe they'd be okay with that sacrifice. I don't know. And this is where it would take an expert in Iranian politics to be able to weigh in on how serious the political statements are. That's fascinating. Uh, well, let, let's 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 go away from practicalities for a moment, and uh, I'd love for you to help us think about the affirmative position uh, on the resolution. States ought to eliminate their nuclear arsenals. Is the affirmative position possible to argue? Oh, absolutely. I like short resolutions like this because they offer a lot of leeway. There's a lot of ambiguities to explore. And a lot of different directions that can be taken. So some things that occurred to me while I was pondering this over last night. Number one, you can take this straight up. And a lot of smart people have advocated the same position. You don't have to go back too far in history. Of course, President Obama, this is one of the things that he campaigned on and was very, uh, he, was, uh, he talked about this a lot during his first term. Uh, President Reagan also talked about this a lot, as ironic as that might seem, but when he was at the Reykjavik summit, this, uh, this was his goal, to eliminate all nuclear weapons. Other smart people, uh, the philosopher Bertrand Russell, was very heavily involved in politics during the early days of nuclear weapons in this position. The uh, ethicist Albert Schweitzer, I have my students read his article on peace or atomic war that's the title of peace or atomic war every semester that i teach in uh, nuclear weapons where he discusses how anything that could happen uh, states should disarm because there is no political consequence which is worse than nuclear apocalypse you can also look at various groups of scientists who have supported resolutions in favor of banning nuclear weapons and i'm sure there's a number of other people but those are uh, who came to mind the argument, the consistent argument, is either that humanity ought to be have more wisdom or enough wisdom to not be involved in this. We ought to know better, especially after having come through the 20th century and somehow surviving that. But also the Schweitzer argument that 
nothing is worse than the final cataclysmic exchange that ends all human life. There's no possible political consequence which could be worse than that. And there's a qualification to go along with that. One of the big concerns that the affirmative can look into, I have an article that I'm uh, working towards publication on this, so I wish I could recommend that to uh, your students. But the number of times we should have died over the course of the 20th century is absolutely astounding and horrifying. And these are from stupid little mistakes. For example, a 40-some cent computer chip. Ah, and as uh, Mr. Herring is pointing out, there's a book, Death by Government. I'm getting this cue card uh, by R.J. Rummel, which might be important to this. But there have been a number of times, especially during the Cold War, but also after the Cold War, that stupid little things should have killed us all. If people followed standard operating procedure, nobody listening to this podcast should be alive. Humanity should be extinct. A 43-cent computer chip one time failed in NORAD and caused the computer system, this was, I believe, in the 70s, uh, caused the computer system to show that Russia had launched all of their nuclear weapons at the United States. And in response to this, we should launch all of ours. There was also a similar situation in Russia. Uh, the guy just died. His name escapes me, but he just died a couple years ago, where the uh, Soviet system showed that America had launched all of their nuclear weapons and we really, uh, so the Soviet Union should launch in return. And it takes, it took individuals thinking things through and individuals essentially denying nuclear deterrence, denying the retaliatory capacity, saying that, no, we, we are okay with dying as long as it does not end humanity in order to overcome these, uh, Stupid errors. Uh, one of my favorites was when Finland, this was in the 1990s, Finland notified Russia, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Finland notified Russia that they were going to launch a uh, satellite, I believe it was telecommunications, and Russia, this got lost in bureaucracy. So Russia saw a launch from Finland and misinterpreted it as a nuclear launch coming at them, and so the standard operating procedure would have dictated that Russia, under uh, Yeltsin, uh, go ahead and start nuking America. Little stupid things like that should have ended us all. The number of computer errors involved with this is substantial. And of course, now uh, China's talking about artificial intelligence ha having the ability to make that nuclear uh, decision. And, of course, Russia and America are you know, trying to catch up on China in this regard. The, the point that I'm driving at is that the risk of error, human error, computer error, error in general, the risk of misinterpretation is so high and the consequences so much higher that it might be best to just to get rid of them all. So that's the first idea that I have. The second one, going back to how we open this uh, conversation, is that verb ought. Now, what's behind ought? It's an obligation. It's an imperative, perhaps, that no action necessarily ought to be taken. No, no action will necessarily be taken, but this is a good idea. Would it morally be good that states ought to eliminate their nuclear arsenals? That's a defensible uh, interpretation of the resolution. Well, yes. Is it a moral thing to get rid of nuclear weapons? Yes. People get overly preachy on this, so you don't want to dive too much into the details. But would it be better? Would the world be a little bit better if humanity did not have the ability to end itself? Probably. Would this be a moral thing? Yeah, I, I think that you could defend that. Practically, would it be... Is there a practical imperative to get rid of nuclear weapons? Well, because of the, uh, the the details that we just got into about the possibility of mishaps and misinterpretation, yes, absolutely. And the other thing along those same lines that I forgot to mention earlier is that nu uh, one of the difficulties with nuclear warfare, nuclear exchange, is telling where it came from. I know this might strike you as a little odd, 
Like, of course, how could we not know where a nuclear missile came from? It's a nuclear missile. This was a lot easier during the time of the Cold War because it was either from Russia or it was from America. But now we're to a place in history where we have eight official nuclear powers and a number of non-official nuclear powers. The, we can't necessarily tell, at least at first blush, where a nuclear missile came from. Yes, there could be some scientific analysis later on, but when you get hit with a nuclear missile, you're not necessarily thinking, well, let's take the time to stop and investigate and have our scientists go in and uh, try to determine where the uranium came from and where it was enriched, what type of uranium, so on and so forth. But a missile drops out of the sky. For example, the assassination this morning. Unless the U.S. takes credit from it for it, this came from a drone, which nobody ever saw, including those who uh, were blown up. And if they did see it, well, they wouldn't be around to talk about it. So nobody really knows where this drone came from. It's just a missile dropped out of the sky. And it takes Donald Trump going on Twitter to declare victory uh, in order for people to be able to tell the source. Transfer that to a nuclear weapon. If Israel drops a nuclear bomb on Iran... Iran could easily think it's the United States. If the United States drops a bomb on China, China could easily think it's Russia. The risk of escalation from there is, well, it's difficult to calculate. It's substantial, though. So these are some ideas for the affirmative. I hope that uh, at least something in there might stir some thoughts. So I think those are some really helpful observations on affirmative. Can you help us? Let's 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 go to uh, let's go over to negative now. Uh, so I know we've talked a little bit already about solvency, and that that seems to me to be the biggest argument that negative is going to have access to. Do you see any other negative ground beyond solvency, or should Neg go all in on solvency? That's a possibility, and certainly not if you're doing. Anything. Now I have now I have an echo. Uh, wait, no echo disappeared. Yeah, you're you're good on my end. Okay, so okay, let's try this again. So solvency is of course a big issue. If you're interpreting this as a policy round, if it's a value round, solvency isn't that big of a deal. I mean, you can say that the imperative doesn't matter if you know there's no possibility that comes to fruition, but. The solvency, you know, that, that could be an important uh, turning point in the debate. I see three other uh, strategies with this. I'm sure there are more, but these are what hit me at first blush. The first one we'll say is responsibility. And I'll encourage your listeners to go check out a guy named Kenneth Waltz. And there's an article provocatively titled, Why Iran Should Get the Bomb. This was uh, from a while ago. Kenneth Waltz has been dead for a while. I don't remember the year of this article. But it's a case about why every, uh, every country in the world should have a few nuclear weapons. Kenneth Waltz is one of the big names in international relations theory. Uh, he's particularly notable for how much he draws game theory into international relations. And his argument back a while ago, was that Iran should be given nuclear weapons if they can't develop nuclear weapons themselves. Why? It's the same uh, principle. There's a guy, I believe this is Gordon Tullock, who make, he's an economist who makes it, the argument that rather than having airbags in cars, instead what we should have is a big spike sticking out of the steering wheel. So you're sitting in the car, and you have your hands on the steering wheel, and there's a big spike about six inches from your chest. Now, of course, this is not as safe as, a, uh, as an airbag, but that's the point. Because you have this big spike pointed at you at all times, you're going to be a little bit more responsible, perhaps a lot bit more responsible. You're not going to be texting and driving. You're not going to be going five mile, uh, you know, 50 miles an hour above the speed limit. You're not going to be swerving in and out of traffic. Why? Because the consequences are pointed right at you, if you'll forgive the pun. That his argument is that the safety features of cars have 
enabled and in fact promoted on safe practices because we know that no matter who uh no matter what happens we'll probably be protected in the car by seat bags the collapsing front uh, that's a seat belt uh the collapsing front end uh airbags so on and so forth kenneth waltz comes at this a similar way that there's a certain sobriety that comes along with having nuclear weapons because one becomes a target Nuclear powers are automatically a target because they can inflict so much damage. So if Iran gets nuclear weapons, everyone's guns are pointed at them. That's his argument. He develops it, and it's it's persuasive. I, it, many people, my students particularly, love this uh, article because it is, it. Uh, delves into the world of rational action within international relations. His, again, the, the point is that having nuclear weapons encourages a certain sense of responsibility that will ultimately promote stability because states are mindful of the consequences because they themselves are in control of these consequences. Everybody's hand is on the wheel, and therefore everything's just a little bit calmer. So I'd encourage uh, your listeners to take a look at that article. The uh, uh, Number two, the, and this is perhaps the more difficult argument to make most of the three, is the idea of political, the idea of politics, making decisions for the whole. And I draw this out of uh, the guy that I wrote my dissertation on, Raymond Arone. He has a massive book, 800 pages, called Peace and War, which for my money is still the definitive text on international relations. In the 600 range, early 600 range, he talks a lot about nuclear weapons. And he addresses somebody like Bertrand Russell very directly. And he says that if one wants to abstain from having nuclear weapons, if one wants to uh, just the same way if one wants to be a pacifist. That is a perfectly acceptable and ethical, moral decision. But it's not a political decision. It is not a decision that one can make on behalf of other people, on behalf of a state. If you want to personally be a pacifist, that's fine. That's great. Good for you. Uh, you are taking a principled stand, and we're very happy for you. But you make that decision on behalf of yourself. If you are a political leader, you are not allowed to make that decision. That is not something that you can do because the point of a state is to protect. And you can go delve into Thomas Hobbes if you want or – Know, Aristotle, for that matter, that you know, part of the purpose of having a state, a political community, is to protect its own members, to uh, band together as a whole in order to defend the whole. So the choice to get rid of nuclear weapons, the same way that the choice to get rid of a military, removes one from the realm of politics. Because at the end of the day, politics and morality ought to be complementary, but they can never be completely the same. It's a more difficult argument to make, but I do encourage your uh, listeners to go give it a look. Number three is the idea of the status quo. Nuclear weapons are really, really good at blowing stuff up. I don't think that that's problematic. But the other thing that they're really, really good at is maintaining the status quo. Now, why do I say that? The period since 1945 has shown us the most stable, the, the, the greatest stability of borders in the history of the world. Yes, you have you know, new states like South Sudan, and yes, occasionally you get a Crimean situation. But these are the exception to the rule. If you go back and look through European history in the Middle Ages, state borders were constantly in flux. And if you go back even farther than, further than that, state borders didn't really exist at all. It depended on the movement of armies and the ability to project power. But we have pretty well settled borders for the most part. Places like Kashmir are the exception. 
And part of this is because of nuclear weapons. That's the reason that India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons pointed at each other. Nothing changes between them. This is why the autonomy center, the uh, the India's recent uh, rollback of autonomy for Kashmir is going to be interesting. Nothing changes. And this was the point of the Cold War that you had, uh, as Churchill called, the Iron Curtain. The Iron Curtain didn't really move back and forth. Why? Because both sides had nuclear weapons pointed at each other. Russia never engaged in an all-out march into the into Western Europe, as many feared. Why? Because nuclear weapons. They're good at promoting the stability of borders, but also they're good at dec- they're good at diminishing the number of actual wars. The period since 1945 has also been, and this will strike your uh, listeners as odd, perhaps. It's been the most peaceful time in the history of humanity. Wars are the exception. And yes, the few wars that do happen are at a greater scale. Vietnam, Iraq, uh, both Iraqs, and uh, various incursions you know, here or there in the other place. Uh, the United States is not the only one that participates in war. We're just really good at it. But by and large, there are far, far fewer wars. Why? nuclear weapons. The Prime Minister of India, who at the time, his name escapes me, this was in response to the first Gulf War in 91. He said that the lesson of the Gulf War, when the United States rolled into Iraq and just stomped them in a matter of a week or two, and he looked at that and he said, the lesson of the Gulf War is to never take on the United States without nuclear weapons. And it's certainly the case. The United States has not been running around the world brandishing its nuclear weapons. The wars that we've gotten involved with notably have not been with Russia or China or anybody with nuclear weapons. We haven't gone into North Korea since their nuclear weapon, uh, their nuclear program took off. Because once nuclear weapons are involved, Everything escalates up a notch. The risks are too great. The same way that we were talking earlier about the potential technical or human errors involved with nuclear weapons. The risk is too great. So therefore, when there are wars, we make sure that it's between two non-nuclear powers, which is the very same reason why we haven't gone into North Korea to settle that situation, but also we're very involved in trying to negotiate with uh our way out of that situation. It's the rationale behind the 2003 invasion of Iraq while uh, Saddam Hussein was on his way to developing weapons of mass destruction or Mm -hmm. nuclear weapons. It doesn't matter for the purposes of this whether or not he actually was, but that was the rationale. We want to make sure that he's not a nuclear power. And that's the reason why the Iran Treaty became very important and why we're so concerned about Iran still is because there's still time to prevent it from becoming a nuclear power. The bottom line here is that once you get rid of nuclear weapons, which ironically are agents of stability, once you get rid of nuclear weapons, we go back to an era in which there are more wars. We go back to an era in which wars are on the level of World War II, catastrophic, even though it didn't involve nuclear weapons until the final days. But the death toll, the death toll was still... It, uh, beyond human comprehension for all set, intents and purposes. Those types of wars become possible again. And the same as we were talking with the Cold War earlier about the Iron Curtain. The reason that Russia didn't advance into the West and potentially the West didn't advance into Russia was because of nuclear weapons. Without nuclear weapons, that Iron Curtain is crossed. You have the uh, the Red Army flag flying, marching into West Berlin and from there into West Germany. And then people start shooting and a lot of people die. So you can explore potential scenarios like that. You can explore potential scenarios of uh, Pakistan and India going to war. And you can just run with that all day. So these are the three strategies that I would suggest to the negative. Uh, first, the 
responsibility engendered by having nuclear weapons, a la Ken Waltz. Uh, second, the idea of politics, the idea of the political community and the responsibility involved on behalf of the leaders, a la uh, Raymond Aron. And the idea of this, uh, number three, the idea of the status quo that nuclear weapons have helped preserve sort of a stability. Nathan, those were three great observations for us, or great great strategies on the on the neg. Uh, that that's really fantastic. I love how you're you're thinking about that. I'm, I'm glad you're able to bring Raymond Aron into uh, into this debate as well. So it sounds like from what you're saying that deterrence is still a really important concept in, in contemporary international relations. This is not just something from back in the Cold War and mutually assured destruction. It's still an active part of the way nations relate to each other today. Yes, I would say so, although it's a lot more difficult than it used to be. The idea of nuclear deterrence is a very fascinating story that I won't bore your, le- your uh, listeners with. But there's a few elements of it that I think are going to be well worth exploring as you try to either affirm or negate this proposition. And but before I do so, let me start by uh, recommending two books on the subject. Uh, the first is The Evolution of Nuclear Strategy by Lawrence Friedman which is a very comprehensive history of how we came up with the current nuclear strategy. It leads up, it's uh, relatively recent, uh, through the Cold War, from World War II through the Cold War into the present. And it turns out that the history is a lot more uh, complicated than we appreciate, much like the making of sausage. It's kind of terrifying to discover how we arrived at these ideas. Even the term nuclear strategy uh, turns out to be an amalgamation. Uh, The second book that I'll recommend is uh, uh, called The Strategy, uh, Strategy in the Missile Age by a gentleman named Bernard Brody. Uh, B-R-O-D-I-E, and it's a very comprehensive uh, exploration of the particular concepts involved in nuclear deterrence, uh, uh, the passive aspects and the active aspects, but also offense and defense. Those are going to be really good sources, particularly to have the language that Brody offers. So deterrence is very important, and one of the things that you discover by reading Friedman is that this is an instance, perhaps the instance, of the academy leading politics. The idea of nuclear deterrence was developed in various seminars by the Rand Corporation and various Harvard professors who were at the time really delving into game theory. And they were taking this and explaining it to the Kennedy administration, the Johnson administration, as well as the Eisenhower administration that here is how we should think about it. There's even talk of them going to talk to their Soviet counterparts and explaining how you can have a nuclear strategy that's not just, hey, let's all kill each other, which leads to various odd ins- uh, oddities throughout history that perhaps aren't as fascinating for everybody else as they are for me. <laughs> More relevant to your current conversation is that this history, this game theory, is all predicated on a two-player model. That there's the Soviet Union and there's America slash the West. At the end of the day, the uh, UK and France, uh, French deterrence, were ancillary to the American deterrent, as, as was China to the Soviet Union, though, of course, that became a pivotal moment in the Soviet Union when China uh, withdraws its support from the Soviet Union. But it's all predicated on a two-player model. If you hit me, I'm going to hit you. We have our guns pointed at each other and at nowhere else. When the United States and now Russia detarget each other in the 90s under the Clinton administration, everything becomes a little bit more problematic. And we dealt, we dove into this uh, slightly earlier when I talked about the ability to tell where a nuclear weapon came from in the first place, which again sounds odd, but that's an actual concern in a world in which there are more than two actors 
well, did this nuclear weapon come from India? Did it come from China? Did it come from Russia? Was it a non-state actor, a terrorist group exploding a bomb in New York City? If al-Qaeda blows up Washington, D.C., the response ought not be to fire at Russia. That would be bad. But you have to be able to tell that it was al-Qaeda. And presumably, the guy who blew up the nuclear weapon in downtown D.C. would not be around to tell the tale. So you have to be able to figure out where it came from so that you're hitting back at the right person. This makes everything in deterrence that much more complicated. The other complicating factor that I think will be important to uh, the debaters in this case will be the idea of a second strike. All of nuclear deterrence is predicated upon being able to hit back after you're hit. There's, of course, the first strike policy. Am I going to hit first? Uh, if I see Russia taking a more aggressive stance, should I throw nuclear weapons at them? But nuclear deterrence, the reason why the missiles stay in the silos rather than being uh, thrown out against an opponent, is the ability to reserve your biggest punch for after your opponent's punch is incoming or already landed. Oh. Now, why I emphasize this is because America and Russia were in unique situations in the Cold War. What's the most defining feature of both countries that they have in common? Well, they're industrial. They had nuclear weapons. But also they're huge. They're really huge. And they had a lot of nuclear weapons. This gets into concepts that Brody will talk about, such as dispersion, spreading nuclear weapons out. Why did we have nuclear weapons in Tucson, Arizona, and in Kansas, and in North Dakota? Well, because those places are really far apart from each other, and if you just throw one nuclear weapon at the United States, you're not going to hit them all. This also gets into hardening. This is a, a passive defense that if you go to the um, Titan II missile silo in, outside of Tucson, Arizona, I highly recommend it. It's a really fascinating experience. That these missile silos are dug in underground. And in the event of a direct nuclear strike, the missile would not be damaged. Because part of nuclear strategy is deciding where exactly you throw your nuclear weapons. Yes, yes, I know that close is good enough in horseshoes, hand grenades, and nuclear warfare. But when you have a country as big as the United States, do you hit Washington, D.C., the political apparatus? Do you hit the biggest population centers like New York? Or do you hit their nuclear weapons, their military bases? All of this is building towards the instability engendered by multiple nuclear powers, which are, especially the ones which are smaller. What I'm getting at is a debate that was huge during the Cold War, uh, at least for our own and certain other uh, observers. Places like the United Kingdom and France, in the contemporary context, Israel, in North Korea, and even Pakistan. Countries that are small have a greater incentive to launch first. Why do I say this? Because they're not going to survive a first strike. If Russia declares war on North Korea tomorrow and launches you know, five uh, MIRV nuclear weapons, North Korea is going to be gone which means that North Korea has every incentive to be a little quicker on the tri trigger. Just like watching a Western and you watch somebody, uh, you watch John Wayne shoot from the hip. Same kind of concept. And this is what worried the United States and why the United States actively tried to quash uh, Charles de Gaulle's regime from getting nuclear weapons. Because, well, not only the personality of de Gaulle, but a country the modest size of France is going to have every incentive to be a little bit quicker to make the judgment call whether or not to go to nuclear war. All of this is by way of saying that geography still matters, first of all. Size still matters, as banal as that might be. But deterrence is a lot more difficult these days. Deterrence requires time, 
patience and clear heads. You don't launch nuclear weapons just because somebody, you know, stepped on your foot or because there might possibly be uh, Russian nukes in the, uh, in the air. You have to have time to consider things. And that's the only thing that saved humanity in the 20th century is that cooler heads prevailed, uh, for example, in the Cuban Missile Crisis. That, yes, it was a compressed period of time, but you had time to stop and deliberate time to talk with uh, Khrushchev and Kennedy, and they could actively, they could think about things. Why? Because both countries knew that if the other one launched, they would have plenty of notice, and they wouldn't be able to take out the other one the first strike. There would be time for a second strike. There would be time to have that punishment that corresponds, that threat which is never made good, ideally never made good. Having multiple states there, with nuclear weapons pointed at each other makes everything a little bit more complicated and gives every incentive to have a quicker finger on the trigger. That complicates things. That being said, and that is uh, ground for the affirmative that nuclear weapons shouldn't exist. That being said, the narrative for the negative is that somehow or another, nuclear deterrence has still held. Even in an age in which there are multiple nuclear nuclear actors, some of which actively hate each other, nuclear deterrence has still held because generally the antagonisms between countries are very clear. Pakistan and India, for example. If a nuclear weapon hits, it's probably from the other one. And you know what? They're probably going to strike back. It's very important, and it's a lot more complicated these days than it's ever been, which brings us back to the earlier topics of discussion. What if Iran is to be taken seriously and they're okay with accepting uh, suicide for all intents and purposes? How do you have deterrence against something like that? How do you have deterrence against a terrorist organization that blows up a nuclear suitcase in uh, downtown New York? Well... That's difficult uh, to say. The least. It sounds like deterrence really depends on rationality. When exactly. you have rational actors, when we can reasonably predict each other's behavior, then deterrence is, is very effective. Mm-hmm. But that that that's. But I think that that gives ground to affirmative to make the argument that you do not always have rational actors. Uh, and, and certainly there are plenty of moments we could look at for uh, the, the Un family, I think, is the easy one that come to comes to my mind, uh, where there, there may very well be a history of clinical insanity running through the Un family that, if you pair insanity with nuclear weapons, could be a recipe for disaster, no matter the deterrence at stake. Absolutely. Very well put. Well, Nathan, thank you so much for uh, for this conversation today. I think this has been a wonderful help to people preparing for this resolution. You brought us a, a level of scholarship and reading uh, that has been very helpful. I appreciate the book references and article references you've given us. Uh, any last thoughts on this resolution or advice you might offer to debaters? I think we've covered just about everything, but it uh, sort of by way of a broad overview. It's a very important question, uh, and a question that I do encourage your debaters to think about, not just in the uh, debate round, but also in terms of their future careers, because nuclear weapons aren't going away, no matter which side wins the resolution, and we need smart people working on things like this, Uh, smart people thinking through the problems. Cyber security is becoming an increasing, and cyber warfare is becoming an increasing difficult problem for international relations to solve, foreign policy to solve, which is infinitely tied into nuclear weapons, uh, not just as an alternative to nuclear warfare, say between the United States and China, uh, but also as a potential security risk in terms of being able to access nuclear weapons. But by way of a broad overview, there's certain, of course, there's other complications involving nuclear weapons um, as well. By way of a broad overview, nuclear weapons, they fascinate me in the study of politics because, as Aron puts it, they're really not all that different from regular bombs. We have bombs now that are that have a greater yield than the Hiroshima bomb did, uh, conventional bombs. 
And at the end of the day, the firebombing of Tokyo is not all that different from the bombing of Hiroshima. But there's still something awful, awful about nuclear weapons and the mushroom cloud. And it's an issue in which international relations and politics meet ethics and philosophy and geography and uh, physics. All things sort of come, all, all roads lead to the nuclear weapon in the 20th century, which is why it's critically important. And it's so, so easy to fall into the trap of being either for or against. Let's ban the bomb. Or, nope, nuclear weapons are great, just like my assault rifle is great. It's so, so easy to declare a side without actually knowing the details. And that's so dangerous. Having the time and the research and the interest to be able to explore the complexities of the subject, to find the various paradoxes that have occurred throughout the uh, history of the 20th century and now the 21st century, it's so important, but it's also so weird. Because the year is now 2020. We don't talk about nuclear weapons like our parents or, for your students, our grandparents did, that we need to hide underneath the desk and we need to have these nuclear drills. How weird is that, that we have the ability to destroy the planet 100 times over? We don't talk about it. It's not in the news. We just kind of have accepted it. And we're not really concerned. And in a way, that's a very good thing. But on the other hand, we still have that ability to destroy the world many times over. That's weird. And so I encourage your students to explore the concept fully. It really does repay uh, intense investigation. And as much as you get into it, that's what you'll get out of it. And you'll never exhaust the subject. Um, so think about it prudently. Think about it from the perspective of a policymaker. Think about it from the perspective of a uh, of a um, ethical philosopher think about it from the perspective of an average citizen that these are concerns that ought not be taken lightly and really do yield uh, really do yield a great degree of knowledge that we don't think about we think you know a nuclear weapon you just throw it at the other guy and he blows up and that's done that's as far as most people think through nuclear weapons but I really do encourage them to take it seriously because we really are dealing with matters of the end of the world. So those are some final thoughts. Great, great list there. Uh, it, I think you're right that it brings in all of the best pieces of debate that is bringing together important matters of policy with long-term strategy, but also equal parts ethics and philosophy. Uh, some other places students may want to look into are the longstanding uh, body of literature dealing with total war and whether or not it is ever ethically permissible to go to war with the intentional with the intention of wiping out the opposition. It's one thing to go to war to settle a question of a land barrier or resource rights or, uh, or, and so on, but that's a totally different thing than uh, genocide. And by the time we get to total war, we are in a totally different area. And the nuclear weapon exchange is that's, – that, that's literally the end of the total war uh, extent, or logical reasoning chain. Uh, one other place that might that comes to my mind, at least, is uh, the tradition that begins with Augustine and Aquinas, and I assume contemporaries are carrying this forward. It's the idea of just war theory, and I'm getting into: uh, Are there principles that we can determine beforehand that govern the kind of warfare a people is willing to conduct? Because we, of course, live in an era where uh, total war is possible and genocide is possible. So at what point are we willing to say we are not willing to engage in this? Even though it is scientifically and technologically feasible, it's not what we as the United States are going to do. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, you mentioned uh, students. So I have one student who's actually coming over tonight for a, a get together. Uh, who his his goal is to one day be a uh, he's in the he's in the Navy and he wants to work as a uh, nuclear submarine engineer someday. Ooh. So 
We're getting there. Uh, oh, you mentioned cybersecurity. Uh, just as our long-term listeners will know, we have a uh, we have I think three or four episodes in a previous public forum debate sequence uh, that's dealing with cybersecurity because that was a recent resolution. And as one last uh, resource recommendation, I played this for all of my students, and at least to help us end a serious episode on a happier note. Uh, students, you should not debate this resolution without having watched Weird Al's music video, Christmas at Ground Zero. Uh, just for all of the possibility of nuclear devastation, Weird Al does his satirical thing and says, you know what? We can cry or we can laugh. And by golly, we're going to laugh because he's Weird Al Yankovic. And it's a great YouTube video. Nathan, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation today. It's been a lot of fun. Always a pleasure, Josh. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for this episode of What's the Res? We have been hosting the ongoing conversation about the current resolutions in the world of high school debate. Today, focusing on the January-February Lincoln-Douglas resolution, Resolve states ought to eliminate their nuclear arsenals. My guest this last hour or so has been Dr. Nathan Orlando, lending us his expertise in international relations and all things related to nuclear weapons. If you want to get in touch with us to let us know what you think about this episode, you can find us uh, in a variety of ways. You can email us uh, at whatstheres at gmail.com. You can reach out to us over Facebook at, what's the, at facebook.com slash whatstheres. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and Reddit at whatstheres underscore. We've also begun uh, building a bigger YouTube following, so do be sure to find us on YouTube. If you... Uh, uh, are like Nathan and I and uh, just can't quite seem to get over debate and you want more debate in your life, uh, then do uh, do find our premium channel where you can uh, listen to a recorded live debate between educated non-experts debating a, a contemporary relevant topic. Uh, Nathan, our, la our latest one might be relevant to you. I don't know if you have opinions about people calling you Dr. Orlando or not, but uh, I debated a friend on the resolution resolve people uh, people with PhDs ought to be called by the title doctor. And I affirmed he negated. So my opponent had a, has a PhD. I hope to someday have a PhD. Uh, and I, I, I had a lot of fun making uh, a Kantian argument that this is a moral obligation to show respect to those who have accomplished uh, this, this uh, crossing of a finish line kind of moment. So... Uh, those are available on our website, which is uh, whatstheres.com. You can click the banner there. That'll take you to a place where you can sign up to pay $3 a month or $30 a year to become a subscriber to our premium channel. Uh, we hope that uh, all of our episodes are of help to you. And with that, uh, we'll see you next time here on What's the Res. Remember, speak well, work hard, and seek the truth. <laughs>